Yo, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to Intuition. In today's video, we're going to be answering some more pharmacy type questions. Not necessarily questions that you'll see on the Netflix, but definitely concepts that you should understand to do well on the exam. So today we're going to be answering a mixture of questions that deal with heart failure, cardiac output, and bleeding risk. So let's dive into it. Question number one says, cardiac output is calculated by dividing arterial pressure by total peripheral resistance. Which of the following conditions would increase cardiac output if arterial pressure remained constant? Select all that apply. So this question is telling us something that we already know, that cardiac output is equal to the pressure divided by the resistance. In this question, we're given different conditions where the pressure remains the same, which means that the heart beats just as hard. So if there's going to be a change in the cardiac output, it's going to be due to a change in the peripheral resistance of the body. So we just need to look at these conditions and see which one would decrease the resistance because if resistance is decreased, then cardiac output would increase. Cardiac output and resistance have an inverse relationship and that should make perfect sense. Okay, so let's look at answer choice A, which says AV shunt. Because there's an AV shunt, there's a direct path between blood in the artery and blood in the veins. Resistance is something that makes it hard for blood to move from the arteries into the veins. But in this case, an AV shunt provides direct access from the arteries to the vein. So there's going to be less resistance to that flow. And because there's going to be less resistance to that flow, an AV shunt will cause cardiac output to increase. So this would definitely be a correct answer as to a condition that would cause increased cardiac output, which is not necessarily a good thing because you're going to be transferring oxygenated blood in the arteries into the veins, which contains deoxygenated blood. So a lot of that blood is gonna to go to waste because really what we want is for the oxygenated blood from the arteries to go to the different organs of the body, go to different tissues of the body, let the different organs and tissues of the body use that oxygen for energy, and then the blood goes into the veins. But with an AV shunt, that oxygen basically gets wasted because it goes directly from the arteries right into the veins. But it does lower resistance and it does increase cardiac output. All right, answer choice B says leg and arm amputation. How will this impact resistance? Remember, in every part of the body, arteries flow into arterioles and from arterioles through capillaries and then into veins. So if you cut off a certain part of the body, leg or arm, what you have done is you have cut off a portion of the body that allowed blood to flow from the arteries into the veins. It will cause resistance to go up, right? Because now the body has less pathways for blood to flow from the arteries into the veins and therefore that will lower cardiac output. So this would not be a correct answer. Answer choice C says hypothyroidism. When it comes to the thyroid, that impacts metabolism. With hypothyroidism, things slow down, metabolism slows down. There's going to be less requirement for blood flow. Instead of having the arteries expand and allow more blood flow, the arteries are going to constrict and cause less blood to flow. So there's going to be more peripheral resistance with hypothyroidism. So this would also lead to lower cardiac output and not be a correct answer. All right, and lastly, we have anemia. So how would anemia impact resistance? Well, think about what resistance is. Resistance is caused by friction between the blood and the arteries, right? That is what causes resistance to blood flow. If you have anemia, that means that you have less red blood cells, which means that you have less particles in the blood to create friction with the arteries. And if you have less blood in your body that can flow, then you have less resistance because the resistance comes from the blood and the arteries. So if there's less blood, then there's less resistance. And therefore, cardiac output would increase in anemia. And this will be another correct answer. All right, so the correct answers are AV shunt, and anemia. All right, let's go on to question number two. Okay, question number two says, which of the following heart failure treatments, in this case is HEFREF, are likely to reduce morbidity and mortality in such patients? So like all that apply. I know the select all that apply question, but we're not afraid, right? Because we know how to think these problems through. So here we're talking about patients with HEFREF, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which means that the heart can only pump about 44% of the total blood that's coming to it from the veins. And here we're being asked to select the medications that will cause the patients and to live longer. And there are two ways to go about these types of problems. You can memorize the guideline and that's fine. That's what most pharmacy students do. But here on Intuition, we don't operate like that, right? We focus on understanding why things are the way they are. We're going to use logical reasoning to arrive at the right answer. When it comes to mortality and living longer, every mammal is allotted a certain number of heartbeats in a lifetime. 
on average. And human beings on average, I think we're allotted about what, 3 billion heartbeats in a lifetime? Now, what determines whether or not you're going to live long or live a short life, assuming that nothing else goes wrong with your body, is going to be whether or not your body is able to sustain strong and healthy heartbeats. So for example, people with high blood pressure are not going to live as long as people with low blood pressure because, because even though their body and their heart might be programmed to be able to beat the same amount of heartbeats, the person with high blood pressure is going to end up having less heartbeats in a lifetime because their heart is pumping against very high resistance. Right off the bat, that tells you that blood pressure medication are going to be good candidates for decreasing mortality in these types of patients. And in this question here, we have two blood pressure medications. We have the ACE inhibitors and we have the loop diuretics. What's going to be correct is the ACE inhibitors and not the loop diuretic. Now, why is that? I mean, both of those medications decrease blood pressure. Loop diuretics, they decrease blood pressure, but they decrease blood pressure by simply eliminating volume from the arteries. And because your veins and your arteries are going to contain less fluid, the pressure is going to go down. That's only going to control symptoms by helping to get rid of congestion within the patient. However, on the other hand, ACE inhibitors decrease heart remodeling. And what that means is that as the heart gets weak, the heart is falling apart, but it's not able to effectively regenerate itself. And whenever it tries to regenerate itself, it does it in a poor fashion and the heart gets weaker and weaker. But ACE inhibitors have shown to lower the rate of remodeling. So the heart is able to better maintain a decent structure over a longer period of time. And remember, it is the heart that's going to determine how long you can live because it is the heart that's pumping the blood. So ACE inhibitors are going to decrease mortality, but loop diuretics are only going to control symptoms. Okay, and another answer choice we have is NSAIDs. This one, you should know right off the bat that NSAIDs are terrible for heart failure. These medications are going to worsen heart failure and not improve heart failure. So NSAIDs will be incorrect and we're left with beta blockers and beta blockers is going to be a correct answer because beta blockers slow down the heart rate, which allows the heart to beat slower and with a smoother rhythm, which allows the heart to function over a longer period of time. And therefore beta blockers are definitely going to help to decrease mortality in heart failure patients. So the correct answers are gonna be beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. All right, let's go on to question number three. Okay, question number three says, which of the following factors are associated with increased bleeding risk? So like all that apply, there are different factors that can increase a patient's likelihood of bleeding, right? So let's go ahead and look at the answer choices. Answer choice A says large APTT. APTT is activated partial thromboplastin time. It measures the time that it takes for a certain volume of blood to clot. So it's similar to an INR. So if a person has blood that has a high or a large APTT, that means that it takes a long time for that person's blood to clot. And if it takes a long time for your blood to clot, then that means that you're going to be at risk of bleeding, okay? So that's correct. Okay, answer choice number two says hypothermia. This one is counterintuitive because with hypothermia, that means that temperature is lower. And if there's lower temperature, which state of blood is going to be more favorable, liquid or solid? Solid, right? You would think. But here's the thing, hypothermia has very negative impact on clotting factors. And this negative impact on the clotting factors reduces their ability to come together and form a blood clot. And instead of lowering bleeding risk, it actually increases bleeding risk. And now answer choice C says treatment in the ICU. Patients in the ICU are critically ill. And oftentimes these are patients who have trauma. If you're in an intensive care unit, your bleeding risk is going to be higher compared to someone who's being treated on the floor. All right, and lastly, we have low anti a activity. anti a activity is something that we measure when we give a patient heparin. Instead of directly measuring the concentration of heparin in the blood, we measure the anti a activity of heparin. So if a patient has very low anti a activity, that means that there's very low heparin in the blood, then that means that a patient is not going to be at risk of bleeding because the patient's clotting factor are not being inhibited and they're allowed to come together and form clots. So this would not be a correct answer. Okay, so the correct answers will be large APTT, hypothermia, treatment in the ICU. Okay, all right, so there you have it. Let me know if you have any questions. If you have any video requests, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. If you're new to this channel, welcome to Intuition. This is a channel where we focus on understanding and learning instead of just memorizing. So hopefully you guys found this video informative. Go ahead and give it a like, subscribe, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, bye-bye.